Hello, I'm Bob Myers, and this year I'm president of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. I want to introduce you to a new series of video interviews I'll be doing here and on our website. These will be informal interviews conducted with authors, scholars, and interested citizens on the authorship question. Maybe they've written books or articles or in other ways sought to explore the life and art of Edward de Vere and the times in which he lived. Other members of SOF will use this platform to introduce you to new events the fellowship is conducting, including some that will be available only to members as a special benefit. Membership dues comprise our largest single source of unrestricted revenue. They really enable everything we do. So if you're not a member, please consider joining. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this new series and I would welcome your comments and suggestions you can shoot me an email at bob at shakespeareoxfordfellowship.org. Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Myers with the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. Um, I am going to talk today to Michael De La Hoya, who is a uh, professor uh, at Washington State University and has edited, introduced, and fully annotated from a, an Oxfordian perspective, this book, I'm centering it now, as you can see, uh, it's uh, a new edition of Twelfth Night. And we are going to talk about that. Um, uh, Michael has a, a, a bachelor, he has two bachelor's degrees, one in English, one in music. Um, <laughs> he has a dog. Um, uh, He's got a master's and a PhD in English from Michigan State. No, strike that, that's wrong. Uh, Michigan, University of Michigan. Um, my son's college team is playing Michigan State in, uh, in the Peach Bowl. Um, and he has a PhD in English from the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, why don't you tell us a bit about your website and a bit about your background that those formal titles really didn't uh, cover. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. My website, um, I started when, when web pages first were a thing. Um, I thought I'd practice that. And especially with the Shakespeare, I thought, no, it was going to be convenient for me to have my notes accessible to me. Um, but I, that was the time I was just starting to teach Shakespeare. And I thought, oh, it's a bad idea if I put all my notes online, because then what if students read them? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, to think about that. What if? And then I thought, wait a minute, that's, that's ridiculous. What if they did? Um, and the classroom's not supposed to be some kind of, you know, conveyance of secret knowledge that I've got. So for my own convenience and just because it was fun, I started... Um, making sure I read all the plays again and gathered some information and then just built these pages. Uh, it's handy now for my students because I can just say, when you're reviewing for an exam, go to my web pages. There'll be quotes there. And if it's a quotation from Shakespeare is important enough to talk about in class, it's important enough to put on the page. Or if I thought it was important enough to put on the page, it should be something that we are discussing too. So rather than, you know, all the many, many, useless uh, plot summaries that you can find online. I recommend those pages to my students. That's how that component got going. Let me uh, jump in and simply uh, recommend to everyone that uh, when this is over, they go to your website, uh, michaeldelahoyd.org, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-D-E-L-A-H-O-Y-D-E.org. It's really terrific and has lots of very interesting uh, information. Um, and the most important question I wanna ask you is what's the thing with Hollywood Squares and Peter Marshall? I was a big fan of Hollywood Squares back when I was young. That's all, I don't know what else. I, I think uh, when I, again, when I was just starting out building a, a website, I just put anything on that struck my fancy. Did and, you know? Did you know that his son was a professional baseball player? Yes. I interviewed uh, Marshall for TV Guide when I was starting out. This was sometime in the 70s. 
and he had just uh, uh, gotten a big new contract. And um, it was a wonderful day spent on the set. You know, they do like, or they did, um, I think five shows in one day, just move the guests in and out. Um, it, it was just fascinating. All right. Yeah. Why Twelfth Night? Why did you choose this play uh, to annotate and to analyze? Well, first, I thought there's a lot in here that's very Oxfordian. So it's not just going to be another edition with explanatory notes to translate particular words, although it includes that, too. But um, I was intrigued by this play and puzzled by this play for a long time. And I remember having a conversation with a colleague about there's something about this play. Can you let's talk about it? And this person just said, no, no, it's, you know, it's just funny because a woman's dressed as a man. I thought, wait, 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 wait. You know, if, if Shakespeare was just making a buck to get some laughs or vice versa, um, then this stuff wouldn't be lasting 400 years. There's something more to it that I just was puzzled about. And some of the statements in there about we are all just trunks over flourished or, you know, just bizarre uh, concepts like that. So uh, for a long time before I ever thought of editing anything, um, this play was in my mind as an enigma to be figured out. Let me take a step back. Um, and in terms of your personal um, uh, approach to scholarship, what comes first? Is it knowledge of Oxford or is it a disbelief in the biography of Shakespeare? For me, it was simultaneous because of what I was reading. Um, but the real... The real start of it, I would say, was a problem with the plays uh, rather than a problem with knowing that disconnect with the, the grain merchant. So when I got started, I was thrown into a Shakespeare class with not a lot of background. And the students decided it would be clever to end the semester with all's well that ends well. Mm -hmm. And I could not understand this play at all. I don't understand... How is this a comedy? What's the relationship between characters? Who's the buffoon? Who am I supposed to credit with having a good perspective? I was just completely confused. And the BBC film version didn't help much. So long story short, I desperately was looking in the, uh, the Ashland Shakespeare Festival bookstore. And, and Ashland, Oregon. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I saw this $50 book about the authorship and I thought, oh, that's interesting, but that's not, you know, what I'm on a mission for here today. And next to it, and that was the Ogburn's or the Ogburn book. And next to it was Richard Whalen's book, more affordable. And it had a chapter I could see on All's Well That Ends Well, which basically said, it's weird because it's autobiographical. And it seems like it's, everything is autobiographical in Shakespeare in a way, but that this one didn't get that treatment, that revision treatment that other autobiographical plays like Hamlet got, where it ends up seeming universal. Um, that one was weird. So it made sense of a play that made sense in no other way, the Oxfordian thesis. And I was addicted. I went home and bought that $50 book too, <laughs> and read that cover to cover and then started it all again and have been, have been addicted ever since. All right, so uh, that's great. Tell us now the process by which you started research into Twelfth Night, how long it took, um, where you did your research, did you go to Italy? Um, bring us up to speed on, on what you did. I started just typing the play about seven years ago. And I'm not saying this is a seven year undertaking, but um, just typing. And when Richard Whalen was uh, the general editor of these editions, he would say that we have the option of just downloading uh, an already existing version. But I wanted to be microscopically close to the text. So typing it myself first, 
So you were typing the play. Whenever yeah, words were on the page, you were typing them in. Blank page. Here we go. Okay. Um, and the next step was for the text um, to consult all the other editions that were valuable. Uh, David Bevington, his complete Shakespeare is brilliant. He's the best editor. But also consulting the first folio, um, you have to get over the hurdle of the first folio because the punctuation is so bizarre and mm. the other features just are um, off-putting. But other additions to make decisions on, all right, should that be a comma or a semicolon? Um, and then consulting first all the, the usual suspects, that is Ogburn, um, Charles Beauclair, um, Mark Anderson, um, Looney, um, everybody that you know we all know the main names for. And then a little bit further uh, to look at other articles. First, actually, generic articles and Stratfordian articles or, you know, uh, general, general articles on Twelfth Night from some of the big names like Harold Bloom and Stanley Wells and just what, what's the, the standard story about this play. But, of course, the Oxfordians have specifics and relevances that they can detect here that are going to be beyond inevitably the Stratfordian perspective, but just get every perspective I can on it, especially what the standard Oxfordian idea is. Um, also, there is a, a scholar named Christian Smid who put out four volumes of uh, evidences of internal evidence of revision in the plays. And it's really valuable. He's not an Oxfordian, but it's really valuable for the Oxfordian perspective to see that Shakespeare has revised and why has he revised and what is his new mission here? And this is especially relevant to Twelfth Night because it certainly looks like you've got Feste patched in at a later stage of revision yeah. and Fabian not completely canceled. Um, and then the change of Viola, who's initially going to present herself as a eunuch and sing the songs. Well, she doesn't sing any songs. She just becomes a servant. Um, and so you're seeing the play in an X-ray version. You're watching it evolve um, and, and migrate from one place to another. Um, is that a sense of it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, I know you have some graphics. We've looked at them before. And I don't want your voice to get worn out this early in what is a fascinating interview. Can we uh, see if we can share our screens and you can uh, call up a number of those uh, images. I know you got the, the Smith book. Um, uh, and just walk us through um, a bit of what you've got here. Okay. And I got to remember, I do want to address the Italy aspect. You Trust me, you will. Okay. All right. Here's the workstation. Um, my old laptop and some of the books that you'll recognize. Uh, Kevin Gilvary's over there. And several editions of Twelfth Night. And I see at the top, that little book is actually an edition of Twelfth Night in Italian that I got in Italy. Um the Epiphania, the Epiphany, um, but it's a trans just a translation of the Shakespeare play, but into Italian. But I thought, is that a is that a glass of sherry that I see to the right of the computer? I think that's probably brandy. Brandy, okay, yes. yeah. Every, every writer needs that. All right, let's go to the next one. <laughs> um, here, as I just said, are some of the main books to consult on any particular play. And here is Smid's Unconformities, he calls it. Uh, this, I, I remember reading this and losing it um, before I got into Shakespeare. And then I wanted to find it again. And it was really difficult because he calls this not revision or evidence of revision, or he calls it Unconformities and took forever to track it down. But it's really valuable. Um, I was also really frustrated, as we all should be, that the one 
smoking gun here is this reference to a pleasant conceit of veer discontented at the rising of a meat gentleman circa 1580. This was, uh, sounds like to everyone, this is Twelfth Night, or at least the Malvolio plot of Twelfth Night. Um, and then he's, he's going to publish it and it disappears. Ugh, so frustrating. Um, and I say the Malvolio part because it does seem like, um, as Catherine Children argues, that you've got court entertainments that once they become or are set to become public plays, um, two short entertainments get woven together masterfully. But you've got the Malvolio plot only, you know, sort of tangentially connected to the Viola disguise plot and the twins. Seems like there are two plays here moved together. And in fact, the Italian background of Twelfth Night would suggest that too. Um, I see MOAI. Yeah, there's MOAI, but just uh, I, here's where I should say about Italy. When I was, um, thanks to the SOF grants in Siena, um, this is where Oxford writes to Burley one of the first days of January. And the Twelfth Night is a big deal in Siena because um, the original plays that inspire Twelfth Night are probably performed there every Twelfth Night. Hmm. So Oxford's probably there. And I would love to be able to find something to pinpoint Oxford in Siena other than the fact that he's writing, writing back. For example, who did he stay with? Um, the problem with Siena research is that their archive isn't going to have anything valuable for us because at Shakespeare's time or the time De Vere was in Italy in 1575, 76, he, um, he seems to have skirted Milan because Siena isn't his own, its own independent region anymore. So there's no main person that he would have stayed with. Like if you go to Mantua, he would have stayed with the Gonzagas. He would have met the Doge in Venice and so on. But in Siena, there's no main family there. So instead, and by this time, if he's incognito anyway, he's not interested in all the politics. He wants to see the plays and the art and hear the music. So who would he have stayed with? Um, when Colleen Moriarty and I were in Siena, we figured, you know, a good suspect would be a fellow named Piccolomini because he and his Academia are responsible for writing that Twelfth Night original play. But we didn't have time and sometime need to go back there and follow up on that. Trail. Yeah. Um, let me let me stay with uh, this uh, Desiderata Curiosa. Um, do we think there may be a copy of it somewhere? Um, or is this one of those cases where the library and bookshelves have been cleaned out of this? Um, what's your thought? It, from what I've heard, this is gone. Uh, Okay. It, it disappeared and any trail that might have been followed uh, proved pointless too. Um, I, and I forget the details, but the, the reference, the Peck, Francis Peck there, um, his, his materials, I believe, have not turned it up either. Okay. So no, we don't know where to go. All right. That. What else you got? Um. I was interested in this all along, this MOAI, that in the play, um, it's driving Malvolio crazy. And Maria, or Mariah, who forged this letter from her mistress, Olivia, drops it and, so that Malvolio will be duped into thinking Olivia is in love with him. And the, he reads, M-O-A-I doth sway my life. And he thinks, M-O-A-I, just what does that mean, M-O-A-I? And eventually he thinks, oh, well, you know, M, my name, Malvolio. Uh, yeah, except A should follow. And he puzzles about this. And from behind the bushes, the, the pranksters are snickering. And one of them says, um, 
a fustian riddle, meaning, oh, a nonsense riddle. Like, isn't that brilliant that she put that in there to drive him crazy? And Toby says, excellent wench, say I. And I always thought that's a little bit ambiguous. Is he saying that, yeah, isn't she brilliant at coming up with a meaningless thing? Or is he disagreeing and saying, no, she is really brilliant and he gets it, but Fabian doesn't, a fustian riddle. I think Shakespeare is constitutionally, it is constitutionally impossible for him to write nonsense. Hmm. The mad ravings of Ophelia, everybody, you know, reads those closely to find out what unhinged her. Um, And I think the only time in Shakespeare where there isn't at least a double meaning is that point at which uh, Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing says, hmm, there's a double meaning in that. That's the only time there's not. But M-O-A-I, what is this? So people have puzzled about this, of course, and have come up, come up with some really bizarre theories, such as um, there, it's this, they stand for the four elements. Okay, brilliant deduction there, but the four elements doth sway my life. What does that mean? Um, someone else decided this is uh, uh, an abbreviation for metamorphosis of Ajax, metamorphosis of Ajax, but Ajax separated out so that the J becomes an I. A Jax or a Jax is a toilet. So huh, that's brilliant, but it sways your life. Uh, so dead ends right and left on this until I, I knew that Alan Green was looking at codes and enigmas. And tell, I, tell us who he uh, is or was. Um, he was the musical director for Davy Jones of the Monkees, um, but, but he got into uh, and he had a he had a number one hit song in uh, the early 80s, too. But he got into the Shakespeare mystery and um, has been a, a dynamo ever since in decoding and, and puzzling through all these enigmas and apparent mistakes in the first folio. There's one in Twelfth Night. I'll get back to, to MOAI, but um, Twelfth Night, the pages go 261, 262, 263, 264, and suddenly you're in 273. And then you go back to 266. And traditionally, I guess universally, everyone said, oh, the first folio, it's just a mess. People screwed up. Well, these are the professionals. And uh, if you have faith, actually, that Shakespeare knows what he's doing, or whoever put together this first folio and the cover page of the sonnets and everything else, you come to the conclusion that these are not mistakes. They are very carefully implanted here. The 273 connected with another mispagination, apparently, gives you um, the Vesica Piscus. It's a, a symbol in sacred geometry that has been taken up by Christianity and art and everywhere else. And it's just the tip of the iceberg that suggests Shakespeare or Shakespeare and compositors here or revisers know exactly what they're doing and they're embedding sacred knowledge. So I'm so, seeing a, a difference of, of nine between, <coughs> excuse me, 264 and 273. Is the nine significant made up of three threes? I don't know. Possibly, possibly. But I know he does need that 273 to match with, I think it's a 165 to make that ratio. Okay. Anyway, this is, as you can guess, because there are other mistakes there in Hamlet and elsewhere, or things that don't get page numbers, that this is an enormous breakthrough um, in in another field. But for Twelfth Night specifically, the M-O-A-I, where... The letter tells Malvolio to revolve. And as Alan Green says, actors don't really know what to do. So sometimes they just spin around and they look foolish, I guess. Maybe that's enough for Malvolio. But if you revolve it directly, A-I-A-O-M, that is the sacred name of the divine in what becomes Freemasonry. So at the time is pre-Freemasonry, but the secret societies 
-hmm. You know, once you get initiated to a certain degree, these one by one letters are revealed to you until you, you know, you have the picture here. Okay. Um, it's pretty daring that he would take that kind of sacred knowledge and plant it right in a play for everybody to see almost. But the IAOM, it's, I, I consider it the, the Western cultural ohm, that sacred sound. All right. and, and there it is. And our attention is drawn to it too, because that's right where the, the pagination weirdness takes place. Got it. What else? What's next? Ah, uh, here is, I, I, for the longest time, adamantly was a fence sitter and did not want to think about the Prince Tudor thesis. That is that the Earl of Oxford and Queen Elizabeth had a son who was brought up as the Earl of Southampton and kept secret. Um, because to me, it is just too heartbreaking to think that Shakespeare invested all of his talent and his life into something that was a lost cause. And, you know, and into somebody who never amounted to anything, really. Mm -hmm. But perhaps that's the, the darkest tragedy of it. Um, and I still don't want 100% to insist on this, but a lot about Twelfth Night, I can't see explained in any other way, including the title. First, though, Viola and her name, you get a reference to violets right off the bat in this play, okay. and then a reference to the, the instrument, the viola, uh, and so on. And if you look at all the moments in Shakespeare where some kind of purple flower seems to be at stake, uh, you won't be disappointed. At the end of Venus and Adonis, there's a reference. In Midsummer Night's Dream, there's a reference. And often it's uh, specifically a type of flower, which in England is called the forget-me-not. Ponce, from which we get pansy, is another one. And forget-me-not, in flower language, is pretty direct. Do not forget me. So if you can see the connections, which are spelled out in the notes in the edition, between Oxford and Arsino, and the connections between Olivia and Elizabeth, or Olivia occasionally even lapses into the royal we, then this go-between, who is represented by a forget-me-not language, seems to be at least Oxford saying, don't forget about me, since presumably at this time he's no longer a favorite with Elizabeth. Or Viola herself is the forget me not, do not forget about our son, our hidden son. A lot of, um, of the statements that Viola makes in the play also are suggestive. Um, and even teasing, saying, I am not what I am, not what I seem, but just not what I am. I don't have my identity yet. The fact that Southampton, when he was young, seems to have been a bit androgynous, um, possibly acting too. And there's a lot of acting language when Viola is talking to Olivia, Viola in disguise as Cesario, and saying so something is, like... It is, isn't this the famous pregnancy dress um, it, that's uh, the that's the possibility uh, adamantly denied by many but you pair that possibility of elizabeth having given birth with these statements like what i am and what i would says viola are as secret as maidenhead to your ears divinity to any other's profanation doesn't that mean that if she had a child to the outside world, since she's the virgin queen, this is profane, but she knows that it's sacred or that Shakespeare, Oxford, is presenting this as sacred, as I'll show in a moment too. Um, the complaint of Viola not being able to reveal who she is or what her estate is actually is recurring. That famous uh, reduction of Southampton's sentence to from 
uh, treason to Miss Prisian. That word gets mentioned, and that's an unusual one. And finally, I'm, I'm, and I'm getting there about the implications here. Um, another one of the early puzzles I had about this play was this emphasis on the numbers one, two, and three, and especially interesting in the end, maybe my, my last understanding about this play was this repeated throwaway phrase, it's all one, or that's all one, where people get out of a discussion or just say, it doesn't matter, whatever. And it's like the subtitle of the play, What You Will, sounds kind of dismissive and throwaway. But that's all one. If you give Shakespeare credit, if you don't shortchange him again, with the impossibility that he actually does have some sacred knowledge or spiritual awareness, the message that's all one has been forever in the consciousness of sacred people, saints and Buddha and everyone. That's the, the spiritual message. We are all one. And I think Malvolio doesn't recognize that at the end of the play. And despite everybody else's, all these other characters' problems at the end of the play and the confusion that they're living under, still, the message, that's all one. The second to last line of the entire play um, suggests that there really is some significance here. Twelfth night, the number <laughs> three comes up. And I got to ask, so finally, what? how do you explain Twelfth Night as a title? The standard explanation is that um, the 12 days of Christmas, this is the end of the Christmas season. So it is consistent with one aspect of the play, which is that we go to excess. The first lines of the play give me excess so that the appetite sickens and I, we're done. Um, the joke against Malvolio, everybody recognizes goes too far. So it seems as if we're pushing past the limits of comedy and recognizing, can you have comedy without somebody getting hurt um, or questioning, but just going to excess and see, seeing what happens. Well, that's peachy, but still 12th night for that. Um, Harold Bloom is disappointed, wishes that what you will were the actual title. Cause from uh, I think commentary in the 1700s people were saying 12th night this doesn't make any sense there are references to spring in the play doesn't pinpoint it but it just seems too arbitrary spring verdant veer maybe that's it yeah yeah spring is always interesting for him but does, is that the setting of the play we it seems like it's more of a springtime play you you can find um productions of it that set it in winter but it doesn't really add anything to it in fact it makes it kind of bleak um the other possibility is not one which is that the the twelfth night is is also known as the epiphany and oh epiphany yeah but apparently that term didn't mean that you know breakthrough of realization that we have accessible to us now but twelfth night well there's mention of wise men in the in the play and this recurring three. What about the three kings? What about Twelfth Night, which is when not the birth of the new king, but the recognition of the new little king by the world's powers? Is that, again, the message of Viola bringing to Elizabeth or, you know, or of Olivia and uh, the little king? Cesario, the name that Viola adopts, is the same. It, it means little king. So what if this is what's being referenced here, the holy family, and this holy family is the message that Veer is pushing on Elizabeth again and again? Hmm. It's a trinity. It's three people. Um yeah, okay. and if and I also think that it's a clever argument. If if um, Elizabeth can't recognize the kid because they're going to blow the Virgin Queen myth, well, who's the Virgin Queen modeled after? You're taking the place of the Virgin Mary, right? Isn't that the mythological idea here? Well, if you're the Virgin Mary, you can't have a kid, 
and he's the new king. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so I pick up your book. Oh, and and here's the cover of the book. Uh, thank you for showing it. The cover was designed by uh, uh, Jennifer Newton, who uh, does a great deal of work for us, and she's just a terrific uh, designer and uh, needs a shout out here. Okay, <clears throat> so I buy my book from Amazon. You, as the author, uh, annotator, What's the best thing, what's the most original or unexpected thing I'm going to find in this book? Help me understand the surprise. Uh, I think you're going to be surprised at how what I just told you holds together and is repeated again and again. It's not just that I've, you know, cherry picked a couple moments and then unleashed the whole Prince Tudor bit or unleashed the whole, oh, is Shakespeare in touch with sacred geometry? But that uh, it opens up, I think, uh, an appreciation for all of Shakespeare too. So I think that you're going to be intrigued by how this notion holds together. Even something that I didn't mention, evidence of um, a secret marriage between Elizabeth and Oxford. We've got some some odd records about meeting with the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury right around right. the time. I, I read that in, uh, uh, in your introduction, and then I went back to uh, Charles uh, Beauclerc's uh, book, which is what you cite here, but he doesn't cite any references. Um, um, and I was wondering if there are references, because that really blew my mind, uh, that that kind of meeting um, uh, with the uh, with the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, would be remarkable. Uh, there are three of them, Beauclerk cites, you cite, um, but how do we know that? I don't remember, um, I, but I'm pretty certain I did see something more specific okay. than what Charles okay. mentions. Um, I wanted to point out as well that as a, as a novice in this stuff, um, I found it, um, any number of references both to concealment and to illusion, um, which I found very interesting. And you, you document them. I mean, conceal me what I am uh, is what, um, uh, in, in, in your note, you then talk about uh, Oxford's theatrical experience seems to have given him the ability to travel through much of Italy in disguise. Now, we know that when he was in Italy, um, he became fascinated by the um, uh, by the acting troops um, and uh, um, may well have brought um, uh, uh, the Italian Renaissance and its um, sense of drama to England for the first time um, that when when he returned. Um, so both in acting and uh, and illusion, which also interested me where, the Duke says one face, one voice, one habit, two persons, a natural perspective that is and is not. And you've got a big note on here on optical illusion, which I found very, very interesting. Um, so that's, uh, so I, I read the notes. Um, uh, so yeah, let I me think, ask you, yeah, go ahead. I think, I think that is right that um, Oxford was inspired not just by theater and music, but by perspective art, the optical illusion art that right. he would have seen, especially in Mantua. And I think that he would have thought, and maybe just instinctively, he would have thought, how can I do that in literature or in theater? How can I make people from one perspective see one thing, from another perspective see something else, or uh, create the illusion of a 3D effect here? How can I trick them? And I think he succeeded brilliantly. Because uh, generally, the notion is that The Taming of the Shrew is a sexist play, uh, unfortunately, because Shakespeare was a man of the time. But if you shift your perspective a little bit, you realize, no, it is not at all that. Merchant of Venice, which I'm really interested in editing. Next. Good. Uh, Good. Same thing. It seems, oh, it's so sad that Shakespeare, you know, went with his times and hated Jews. Well, no, not at all. You have to ignore a whole lot if you're going to take that stance on that play and not realize from a different perspective. No, he is 
giving a the blackest condemnation of racism in that play among these, you know, smug, self-satisfied, insulated Christians. And and so the only artist mentioned by name in the works of Shakespeare is Giulio Romano, whose work he saw in uh, Verona. Am I correct on that? In Mantua, especially. Mantua, sorry. Yeah, I mean, that's that's just fascinating stuff. Um, parenthetically, the, uh, uh, the COVID um, uh, epidemic is keeping my wife and I from uh, going up to Boston uh, to see, in the last few days to see the Venus and Adonis by Titian uh, with the bonnet right. uh, that they have up there. We were going to go, and I said, eh, not going to do it. I'm just saying, not going to take that risk. So we'll be forced to uh, uh, to go to Mantua to see it. Um, you know, rats. But um, <laughs> all right. Um, look, what do you think I've missed on all this um, uh, that that is important for this book? Um, I don't know for sure, but I would say that I was making what I would call discoveries up to the very last minute and beyond. And I have to recognize no edition is ever done for all time. Um, and uh, I'm sure there are a couple of things that I thought, ah, if I could only add those. Um, but I will say on the, on the COVID point that even though I may have started typing this seven years ago and then let it slide forever, um, it's, I don't want to cheer COVID here, but <laughs> this is what I, this is what I've been, how this is how I spent my two Sunday vacations. All right. Um, finally, uh, you gave it away, but tell us briefly about your next project, your next Oxfordian project. Well, I started collaborating with Jennifer Newton on Comedy of Errors and gave a presentation at a conference many years ago. And I thought, you know, that's that would be a quick one. It's a short play and it seems to be an early play and it's not got the complexities of Twelfth Night. So maybe I could knock that out. So what's the bad fast. news on the short play? Easy to knock out. The bad news? Yeah. It takes uh, a long time. No, no, it's just not going to be as interesting and not oh, have okay. as many engaging notes. But I'm also simultaneously working on Merchant of Venice now too, Excellent. and at the you know typing out phase yeah. and and, uh, freight and um, checking on the other editors, other editions. Good. So right, that so one is got, got, has got the complexities, and I think it's important to uh, get out that minority opinion about that play too, so that people don't just dismiss it as Shakespeare's one time where he's just a racist. Um, so when you finish it, let us know. We'll be back uh, with our Zoom cameras. Uh, may not be Christmas time. Merry Christmas. Happy Peace Day. I see the uh, symbol in the background there. Um, this has been great. I really appreciate your taking the time. I especially appreciate uh, the work on the book, which I enjoyed reading again with a new understanding from an Oxfordian perspective. Michael de la Hoyt, thank you so much. Um, and uh, good luck with the book. Keep in touch. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.